Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on classical mechanics and relativity. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be using the principle of least action to derive the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. I'll introduce the concept of generalized coordinates, and we'll see that the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion apply with equal ease in any coordinate system and in any reference frame. I'll then do a few examples to show the, the power of this new approach. And finally, we'll uh, extend this to the Hamiltonian formulation. We'll perform a Legendre transformation of the Lagrangian to obtain the Hamiltonian, and we'll see the equivalence with energy. This is an introduction to these new areas, and in the future lectures, we'll go into more detail and do some more examples. Okay, so let's get down to work. In the last lecture, we introduced the principle of least action and showed that it implies Newtonian mechanics. We argued that, in fact, the principle of least action can be used to derive Newton's second law, f equals ma. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce the idea of generalized coordinates. And using the principle of least action, we will derive the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion. This plays the same role as uh, Newton's second law, which is the equation of motion uh, of classical mechanics, but is put on a more general footing and we'll see that we'll be able to use different kinds of coordinate systems with equal ease. So let's quickly recap the contents of the last lecture. Imagine that we have a start point at R1 and an end point at R2. We're going to consider paths that start at R1 at time T1 and end at R2 at time T2. For example, let's consider this blue path. However, we can also consider other kinds of paths for example, this green path, or this yellow path. We can imagine, in fact, all possible paths. And the question in classical mechanics, the central question, is of all the possible paths that you can imagine that go between the start and end points, which is the correct classical path? And of course, Newton's second law tells us which is the correct classical path. We get from Newton's second law an equation of motion, which we can integrate up to find the trajectory, and then we can compare it to our various uh, possible trajectories and pick out the correct one. The alternative formulation that we developed in the uh, last lecture is, is deriving from the principle of least action. The correct path is the one with the least action. And these two ways of determining the correct path are equivalent. That's what we showed in the last lecture. So let's just run with the second version, uh, the least action principle. We define the action as a functional of the path. The path is the trajectory r of t, not at a given time t, but the entire path over the whole time. And we write this as an integral over time from the start time t1 to the end time t2 of this thing called the Lagrangian. And this Lagrangian is a function of the position and the velocity. And also, in principle, it could be time dependent. Now, to actually be able to use this, we need to know what the Lagrangian is. And for most mechanical non-relativistic systems, we have an expression for the Lagrangian. It's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, which is a half m the mass times uh, the velocity squared, which I'm going to write as r vector dot squared. The dot above a letter here, of course, as usual, means the time derivative, minus the potential, which is some function v of the position, r vector, but not the velocity. And this holds for each particle. Now, notice here that I said that this is the expression for the Lagrangian for most mechanical systems. That's because when we go to other theories, for example, electromagnetism, which we'll touch on in a future lecture, um, we'll see that this takes a little bit of a different form. 
Um, there is still a simple Lagrangian, uh, but it's not quite as simple as just the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Um, and I also mentioned here that this is the result for non-relativistic systems. Again, in the second part of the course, we'll generalize this to relativistic systems, systems where the particles are moving very quickly. And what we'll see is that the form of the uh, kinetic energy there gets a bit changed. Uh, we'll derive that presently, um, but for now, for regular mechanical systems um, we'll, which aren't moving uh, terribly quickly, uh, this expression that I've written down here is the one that we'll use. What we now want to do is to use uh, the principle of least action to find uh, the correct classical path, and that's the one which minimizes the action. And that boils down to a condition that we explored in the last lecture. It's that ds is equal to zero, the first order variation in the action around the correct classical path is equal to zero. Okay, so let's generalize this now. So we're going to generalize this formalism to any number of particles or objects and any number of dimensions, although in practice that's going to be one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions, and any coordinate system. So either Cartesian coordinates or arbitrary curvy linear coordinates, and it could be an inertial uh, coordinate system or a non-inertial coordinate system, for example, a rotating frame of reference. So we're going to put this on a totally general footing now, and we're going to be able to do that through the concept of generalized coordinates. These generalized coordinates are traditionally denoted Q, and I'm going to let this Q stand for a whole range, a whole bunch of different coordinates. Let's call them Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. So Q here stands for the set of generalized coordinates. To make this more concrete, let's just consider some examples. Consider as a first example, n particles in three dimensions. In this case, I could write down generalized coordinates, which would be, for example, the x-coordinate of particle 1, the y-coordinate of particle 1, and the z-coordinate of particle 1, and then the x-coordinate of particle 2, the y-coordinate of part particle 2, the z-coordinate of particle 2, and so on, all the way up to the Z component of uh, particle n. So in total, here, there would be 3n coordinates. Why is that? Because we have three dimensions, so we have to specify x, y, and z for each particle, and there are n particles. Okay, as a second example, a very simple example, let's consider a single particle in spherical polar coordinates. In this case, the generalized coordinates would be r, theta, and phi that define our coordinate system using spherical polars. We specify a radius and two angles. Um, another example might be where we choose some coordinates that are kind of tailored to the system that we're interested in. Consider a simple pendulum. Let me draw a little diagram. Imagine here that we have a pendulum with a uh, mass hanging from the bottom of it. What would be a good uh, coordinate system to describe the uh, position of this mass at the end of the pendulum? Of course, we can specify its x and y coordinates, but that's actually an overkill. We don't need to specify two coordinates because those coordinates are actually constrained by the so-called pendulum constraint more on this later, which is that the length of that black line there is L. In particular, we have that by Pythagoras, L squared is X squared plus Y squared. So the Y and X components of the position of that blue mass there are not independent. They're constrained by that equation that I've written down. So actually, um, perhaps a better choice would be rather than to specifying X and Y or um, or some other coordinate, to actually specify here the angle, theta, because we know that the pendulum just bobs backwards and forwards, and it performs simple harmonic motion with a changing angle. So in this particular case, there is actually only one coordinate that we need to specify, and we would say that the generalized coordinates, q, in this case, is that angle, theta. We can go further. Let's consider a double pendulum, 
So the double pendulum is a classic uh, setup in classical mechanics. It's one where you have one pendulum hanging off another one, basically. We'll actually discuss this in quite some detail later on in the course, because it actually has rather interesting behaviour. It shows classical chaos, but more on that in due course. So um, one angle we could specify here is this angle, theta 1, let's call it. And then we could define a second angle here, theta 2. And this completely defines all of the possible states of that system. We don't have to define the x and y coordinates of the two masses. We can just uh, define the, the state of the system in terms of these two angles, uh, theta. So in this case, our generalized coordinates q would be just the set of coordinates which allow us to totally specify the state of the system. In this case, it's theta 1 and theta 2. So you can see by these last two examples that I can actually implement directly any constraints in the system uh, through uh, a judicious choice of our generalized coordinates q. So it turns out there is a bit of artistry, let's say, in solving classical mechanics problems. And um, the ingenuity, if you like, is something that comes from the proper choice of good generalized coordinates. And so the idea is that we can formulate our Lagrangian and use the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion within the framework of these generalized coordinates. So we can write down a Lagrangian L which is itself a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized velocities and time. And this again is a shorthand notation for the generalized coordinates Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. The generalized velocities Q1 dot, Q2 dot, q3 dot, and so on, and then eventually at the end, time. So the Lagrangian can depend on all of these different uh, things. So just let me annotate this. The q are the generalized coordinates, and the q dot are the generalized velocities. So as before, the Lagrangian can be formulated in terms of energy. We write that L is T minus V. And all we need to do is express our kinetic and potential energies in the generalized coordinates. And we'll do some examples of that later. And then we can uh, use the principle of least action to find the equations of motion. Now, we don't want to go through the whole process of applying the principle of least action each time. So what we're going to do is just do this very, very generally. We're going to consider a completely general Lagrangian of this form with an arbitrary number of generalized coordinates, velocities, and time. And we're going to apply once and for all the principle of least action to obtain a generalized equation of motion. That will be the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion, and it will apply for each of the general coordinates separately and it will have the same structure for each of the generalized coordinates, independently of what they are. And this is extremely nice. This is exactly what we wanted. Because, as we saw in the first lecture, if we try to do this with the usual Newtonian formulation, then the equations take different forms and begin to look very, very, very complicated as soon as we move away from the simplest Cartesian description. So we have the principle of least action. It tells us that the path with the least action is the correct one. That's stated as ds is equal to zero, where we need to know what the action is. And the action s is, of course, the integral of this Lagrangian over time. Uh, now, of course, we don't want to have to test all of the incorrect paths to work out which one has the minimum action. Uh, we would just want a nice simple systematic approach which is predictive and just tells us directly which of all of the paths is the correct one. So the strategy here will follow something similar to what we did in the last lecture, but this time we'll be a bit more precise and rigorous about it and we'll do it in terms of all of these generalized coordinates. Good.
So what we want to do is, first of all, uh, find an expression for ds and then set that equal to zero. How do we do that? Well, let's start with the definition ds is equal to the integral of dl dt. So here I'm saying that a small difference in the action is introduced by having a small difference in the Lagrangian itself. So what is this dl? dl is a small deviation in the Lagrangian. So what causes a deviation in the Lagrangian? Well, the Lagrangian will change if uh, any of the things on which the Lagrangian depends change. So f as we can see from this expression here, if we change any of the generalized coordinates, the Lagrangian will change. If we change any of the generalized velocities, the Lagrangian will change. And there's a way of encapsulating this neatly uh, in a formal mathematical way, which is through the expression of the total derivative. And that is that I can write the total derivative dl as a small deviation along the direction dq1. And the magnitude of that deviation along dq1 is precisely partial dl by dq1, keeping everything else constant. Likewise, um, there is a small deviation along the direction uh, q2. The magnitude is dl by dq2, and so on. And you do that for all of the possible generalized coordinates. In addition, the Lagrangian will change if I change any of the generalized velocities. And so it makes sense that there would be a deviation along the q1 dot direction whose magnitude is partial dl by dq1 dot, and so on along all of the other uh, velocity directions. And so on. So that is uh, a formal mathematical uh, and rigorous expression for the deviation of the Lagrangian dl, and we can substitute that in to our expression for ds to find the corresponding deviation in the action. So let's do that. Um, let's write this out and collect up the terms in the integral in terms of uh, q1 and q1 dot, and then q2 and q2 dot, and then q3 and q3 dot, and so on. So let, let's collect it up according to the which degree of freedom we're talking about. And this is what we get. We can break it down into this first term here in the uh, round brackets, which tells us um, that there's a contribution to the integral for the action involving the, the position and velocity of coordinate number one. Then here we have a contribution coming from the position and velocity of coordinate two. Here we have one for the position and velocity of coordinate three, and so on. We work through all of the possible generalized coordinates, add them up, integrate over time. Now, the trick that we introduced in the last lecture is to use integration by parts on these velocity terms. And that will allow us to express everything in terms of deviations along the uh, generalized coordinates, the q1s, q2s, and q3s. At the moment, you see that we have uh, this ds in terms of uh, differences along q1, q1 dot, q2, q dot, and so on. And the strategy is to try to eliminate these generalized velocities, q1 dot, q2 dot, and so on. And we can do that using integration by parts, as I mentioned. And that's because if we specify the entire path um, from start point to end point, uh, then the uh, velocities are already completely determined. So the path, which is the trajectory as a function of time, contains in it the velocities the positions and velocities are not actually independent coordinates if we consider the entire path. 
and we're integrating over the entire path, and so it should be possible to eliminate the dependence in this equation on these dq1 dot, dq2 dot, dq3 dot, and so on. So that's what we're going to do now. So let's consider an integral of this type. Um, we can apply the usual integration by parts to shift the time derivative from this factor to this factor. Remember, of course, that this q dot means d, dot, d by dt of q. It's a time derivative. So this integral actually means this. An integration by parts is going to shift this d by dt from the factor q to this other factor, dl by dq dot. And we do that at the expense of a boundary term. So this is equal to minus d by dt of partial dl by dq dot. And that's now multiplied just by dq. And that whole thing is integrated over time. And the boundary term that we get uh, is simply dl by dq dot multiplied by dq, and that's evaluated at the start point and at the end point. And as we emphasized in the, the last lecture, the start and end point of the paths are always the same. We consider a common start and end point, and then we consider different paths that go between those points. So dq in this, uh, in this expression here is actually equal to zero when evaluated at t1, and at t2, because that's the start and end points where the paths coincide. So uh, neatly, that term uh, disappears. OK, so we found a way of expressing uh, this term, which comes up in our expression for ds in a slightly different way. Uh, let's plug that in and see how it all looks. And when we plug it in, this is what we get. And I've organized this again in, by um, generalized coordinate by generalized coordinate. So here we're just talking about things involving uh, the generalized coordinate q1. In the second term, we're just talking about things involving the generalized coordinate q2 and so on. So let's just look at one of these expressions. Uh, all of the rest are the same. You just replace the ones by twos. In this first expression here, we have dl by dq1 uh, and d by dt of dl by dq1 dot, but both terms are multiplied by the same common factor, dq1. So I can express this in a slightly simpler fashion just by uh, factorizing all of that out. And this is what we get. Um, I've written this here as a sum over all the generalized coordinates. So q1, q2, q3, and so on. They're all just uh, referred to here as the qi's. And then we have corresponding velocities qi dots. So the total ds, the total differential ds, is equal to sum over the different generalized coordinates. And then we have this expression multiplied by dqi. And that's integrated over time. And remember, we're integrating from time to the start, from the start point to the end point. We called those previously t1 and t2. So I'll just write those in on the integral sign there. Um, so what we want according to the principle of least action, is that this expression is equal to zero for the correct classical path. And the only way that this thing can be zero is if individually each of these terms in the square brackets is equal to zero. So ds is equal to zero for any change in the path, i.e. any deviation in q1, any deviation in q2, and so on. So each of the contributions must uh, separately and individually be equal to zero. And that gives us a condition uh, which is, in the end, the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion that we're looking for. We find that dl by dqi minus d by dt of dl by dqi dot is equal to zero. That equation is the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion, and it holds separately for each qi. So there is one of these equations for each generalized coordinate qi. So let's say I had a single particle in three dimensions in Cartesian coordinates. I would have three generalized coordinates for the x, y, and z uh, position of the particle.
at any given time. And therefore, I would have three such of these equations. One of them would be dl by dx minus d by dt dl by dx dot equals zero, and then the equivalent one for the y and the, another one for the z. But of course, the beauty of this approach is that I can formulate the Lagrangian in any coordinate system I like with any arbitrary generalized coordinates. And these equations take exactly the same form and they're completely decoupled from each other. So I get one equation for uh, each of the generalized coordinates. If I have uh, n generalized coordinates, I have n of these equations. So we see that the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion generalizes Newton's second law. This can be made more transparent by defining a generalized momentum. We say that for a generalized coordinate qi, the corresponding generalized momentum, pi, is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the uh, generalized velocity, qi dot. And this is referred to as the canonical momentum. And uh, more on that shortly. So this is an important expression, an important definition. Likewise, we can define a generalized force. We can say that for a given generalized coordinate qi, we can define a generalized force uh, fi as the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to that generalized coordinate qi. And then uh, our Euler-Lagrange equation of motion takes a familiar form, and it looks rather like Newton's second law, namely that fi is equal to pi dot. So this looks like Newton's second law, uh, f is equal to p dot, except now we're doing it with generalized coordinates and we have an equation uh, that looks like Newton's second law, fi equals pi dot, but involving the generalized momentum pi and the generalized force fi, and this hold for each generalized coordinate qi. Notice here that this kind of equation, f equals p dot, for, new, for pure Newtonian physics, the way that Newton uh, described it, really exists only for the true force and true momentum involving uh, Cartesian coordinates in the simplest possible case. When we write it in terms of the Lagrangian, and we use the generalized momentum, pi, and the generalized force, fi, this really holds for any coordinate system in any frame of reference. Later on, we'll return to the idea of a generalized force and show that there is, in fact, an even more general definition that we can come up with. Uh, but in this context, let's just stick with this definition, fi is equal to pi dot. OK, so let's have a look at an example. Let's consider polar coordinates in two dimensions. What I mean by that is we're going to consider the Cartesian coordinates x and y in the plane being mapped to r and theta in the plane. These are polar coordinates for the uh, radial extent r and the angle theta. This means that we have a point here uh, at position x, y, and we can describe that in polar coordinates as uh, a radial extent r and an angle from the x-axis theta. This implies directly that the vector from the origin to the point x, y can be described as a radial extent r in the r-hat direction. r-hat is the unit vector in the radial direction. Um, and in the last lecture, or in the first lecture, I think, we looked at an expression for the velocity, and we derived this expression for the velocity in polar coordinates. And the point is, we only have to do this once. Once it's done, we can find an expression for the kinetic energy that holds then for every situation in polar coordinates. Let's have a look at that then. So if we have a velocity vector, r vector dot, then this tells us that the velocity squared, which just means r vector dot taken with the dot product with itself, um, is obviously r dot squared plus r theta dot squared. 
This is a scalar quantity, which we obtain from the expression here for the vector velocity. And I get that just by noting, of course, that r vector hat dot r vector hat is equal to 1, theta hat dot theta hat is equal to 1, but r hat dot theta hat is equal to 0. That is basically defining our orthogonal right-hand set for our coordinate system in polar coordinates. We're having unit vectors here, so these dot products equal 1, uh, but uh, directions along theta and phi are orthogonal or perpendicular, and so the dot product between r and theta hats are equal to 0. So using these relations, it's very easy to derive this expression for the velocity. Therefore, we can very simply express our Lagrangian in plane polar coordinates, t minus v, a half m r vector dot squared minus the potential v of r. And uh, for an arbitrary potential v of r, we can now express this in polar coordinates as a half m into r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared minus the potential. I'm going to write the potential now in terms of r and theta. And this is now the general expression for the Lagrangian in plane polar coordinates. Um, we can go a little bit further. We can work out the generalized momenta and the generalized force and then find uh, Lagrange equation of motion for this uh, coordinate system. So let's now do that. The generalized momentum is dl by dqi dot, by definition. That's the definition of generalized momentum pi. And so in this case, um, we can use this general definition to write a momentum in the r direction and a momentum in the theta direction. PR is partial dl by dr dot. P theta is partial dl by d theta dot. And with our Lagrangian at hand, we can now just calculate these things explicitly. Notice that the potential depends on r and theta, but not on r dot and theta dot. It depends on the generalized coordinates and not on the generalized momenta. So pr is dl by dr dot. We can easily uh, obtain that, and we can find that that's equal to mr dot. Whereas for the generalized momenta in the theta direction, we actually get mr squared theta dot. That just pops out automatically. OK, let's have a look at the generalized forces now. These are defined in general as dl by dqi. And in this case, again, we have two different types. We have fr for the force along the radial direction and f theta for the force along the theta direction. In the r direction, what do we get? We get mr theta dot squared minus dv by dr. Along the theta direction, we just get minus dv by d theta. And that's because uh, along the r direction, we actually have this piece here that involves r, uh, whereas we don't have any piece that depends just on theta in this first term. We only have terms that depend on theta dot. Remember, these are partial derivatives, so we only pick up a contribution if we have an r and a theta explicitly in here. Uh, r dot and theta dot don't count. Uh, the potential, however, can depend both on r and theta, which is why we pick up these two terms. Now remember, in terms of the standard Newtonian force, which would be minus the gradient of the potential, we'd pick up these two terms, 
but in the Lagrangian framework, notice we get these additional contributions, and there, of course, in this uh, polar coordinate situation, the pseudo forces that we discussed in the first lecture, those things are basically contributing to the centrifugal force. So what I'd like to do now is to actually derive the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for this uh, coordinate system. And we do that simply by saying that fi is equal to pi dot for each of our generalized coordinates. So our Euler-Lagrange equation of motion is dl by dqi is equal to d by dt of dl by dqi dot, which with the definitions that we've, uh, that we've written on the previous slide, uh, can be reduced to fi is equal to pi dot, which then looks to be in the sort of familiar form of Newton's second law, but this time with our generalized coordinates. So using the expressions we've just derived, we can find an equation of motion in the r direction. And this gives us mr theta dot squared minus dv by dr is equal to d by dt of the generalized momentum, which is mr dot, which of course is then just mr double dot, performing that time derivative. Okay, so that's the final result. We have that mr double dot is equal to mr theta dot squared minus dv by dr, this is the expression that we derived uh, in the first lecture by by hand, brute force, uh, by doing the, the coordinate transformation from Newton's second law. And we see that I mentioned earlier that we have the central force here appearing automatically. Uh, which is very nice. Furthermore, we can find the equation of motion in the theta direction with equal ease, and we get minus dv by dr is equal to d by dt of the generalized momentum, which we previously calculated to be mr squared theta dot. Here we have the product of two terms, r squared and theta dot, which both depend on time, so we need to use product rule when evaluating that derivative. We're going to get two terms, and they are mr squared theta double dot plus 2 mr r dot theta dot. So we just do the usual uh, differentiation, crank the handle, and come out with this. And that implies the equation of motion along the theta hat direction. And that is mr into r theta double dot plus 2 r dot theta dot is equal to minus dv by d theta. So very simply, using this framework, we can crank out these two results. And this second one in particular is completely non-intuitive from the Newtonian perspective. So the equations that I developed on the previous slide are totally general for um, the plain polar coordinate setup. Let's actually now apply this to a real world example. The simplest and most famous one is probably the simple pendulum that I've sketched here. We have a mass m that's connected at the end of our pendulum. The pendulum is of a fixed length. So that means the radial extent of the mass from our pivot point, which is fixed, is some fixed number. It's some fixed length, which I'll call L. So L is uh, pendulum length. It's constant. And this is a constraint. It's a constraint because if I were to write the x and y coordinates of the mass, I would be able to connect those by Pythagoras' theorem and say that x squared plus y squared is equal to l squared. And so x and y coordinates of the mass are not independent. They are connected by the pendulum constraint. Um, 
So how should we describe the, uh, the equations of motion for this pendulum? Well, the sensible thing is to describe it in terms of this angle, theta, which will uh, increase and decrease as the pendulum bobs backwards and forwards, always with fixed r equals l. So what we want to know is what are the dynamics of the angle theta? In particular, what is theta of t? Well, we've just worked out the equation of motion for theta. So let me just restate that from the previous slide. And actually, we can already make a simplification of this expression because uh, we actually know that this term is equal to zero because r dot is equal to d by dt of r, which here is l, that's a constant, and therefore d by dt of it is equal to zero. And that's coming because of the pendulum constraints that l is a constant. So actually that second term drops out. Another small simplification is in the first term, we have this r appearing here, and r is equal to the constant l. This will then be an equation of motion involving theta double dot, the acceleration, if you like, along the theta direction. We still have this term on the right-hand side involving the uh, derivative of the potential with respect to theta, so we need to write down what the potential is before we can continue to, um, to calculate this equation of motion. The potential is the weight mg times the displacement uh, z, this is the displacement in the vertical direction, and we need to now convert that z into these plane polar coordinates. And using a bit of trigonometry, it's obvious that this is mgl into 1 minus cos theta. So just as a little sanity check, let's plug in some numbers. Imagine that theta is equal to 0, cos theta is 1, and therefore the potential is set to 0. So we're giving the the, the, the reference point, if you like, for the potential, uh, meaning the potential set to zero uh, when the pendulum is at the bottom of its swing. And then as theta increases, the potential increases. In particular, when theta is 90 degrees or pi by two, uh, we have a potential which is mgl. So this all works out nicely. So let's now calculate the uh, derivative minus dv by d theta, which gives us mgl sine theta. Very good. So now we can write down the equation of motion. It will be ml squared theta double dot is equal to minus mgl sine theta. And we can simplify that a bit to obtain the final expression for our equation of motion in the theta direction, which is that theta double dot is minus g upon l sine theta. And this is the exact equation of motion for the pendulum. Now, often you see a linearized version of this equation, but this equation, as we see it here, is the exact version. To linearize it, we simply expand the sine theta here as a power series in theta using the usual Taylor series expansion and just take the first term, which is linear in theta, and that approximation is valid for small theta. So the linearized version of the equation of motion is theta double dot is equal to minus g upon l of theta, and that is correct to order theta cubed, and hence is valid for small theta. And uh, when you go ahead and solve that, we all know that you get simple harmonic motion in theta. We have here a simple second order differential equation in theta, and the trajectory in theta is some initial amplitude theta naught cosine 2 pi t 
over the period t naught. Uh, that's just uh, the general form of the solution to such a differential equation. The boundary conditions tell us that the initial angle uh, that we set the pendulum off is the theta naught there. And then we can also simply read off what this time period t naught is. t naught is simply 2 pi square root L upon G. And uh, the nice thing about this expression, of course, is that if we work in SI units and we say that L is a pendulum of length 1 meter and G is 9.8 meters per second squared on the Earth's surface, uh, we can work out this expression and magically it gives us a, a, a time period for the swing of the pendulum of almost exactly two seconds. It's actually 2.006 seconds. So this is nice, of course, because a pendulum of one meter sort of ticks basically uh, like a clock with each swing back and forwards being one second. Of course, this is the linearized equation. Uh, you can actually go direct back to the original non-linearized equation and solve this exactly. It's a bit more complicated, but that certainly can be done if you're interested in getting the really accurate solution, even for large angles. So let's just make a summary of some of the limitations of the old Newtonian formulation and the corresponding advantages of this new Lagrangian formulation. Well, first of all, in terms of the Newtonian formulation, Newton's second law, F equals MA, takes a different form in different coordinate systems, especially curvy linear coordinates. It also takes a different form in non-inertial reference frames. Meanwhile, in the Lagrangian formulation, uh, this works in arbitrary generalized coordinates, and we have the same equation of motion, the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion, for any generalized coordinate. The Euler-Lagrange equation of motion always holds. So there's no need to draw diagrams and draw arrows and work out forces and all of this. There's no need to reformulate Newton's second law every time we go to a different coordinate system. And this, of course, is essential as we go to much more complicated systems. Anything that involves an intuition and drawing diagrams and all of this is not going to work when we go to complicated systems. So we need a more powerful formulation, and that formulation is the Lagrangian mechanics. In the Newtonian formulation, we also see the appearance of fictitious pseudo-forces when we use any coordinate system that's not the simplest Cartesian system. For curvy linear coordinates, for non-inertial reference frames, we see the appearance of these uh, pseudo-forces, for example, the uh, centrifugal force. Whereas with the Lagrangian formulation, all of these things just appear naturally when using the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion. In particular, the Lagrangian that we use in the equation of motion is t minus v is the same in all coordinate systems. We also see that the Lagrangian is a scalar quantity. It's just the energy, it's not a vector. The equations of motion are also scalar equations. We have one equation of motion for each of our generalized coordinates. Whereas in the Newtonian formulation, of course, we're working with vectors. We have forces which are vectors, accelerations which are vectors, and we need to use vector addition. We saw how this becomes very complicated when translating the unit vectors from one coordinate system to another. In the Newtonian formulation, it's also quite difficult to exploit symmetries in the problem or implement constraints. Whereas in the Lagrangian formulation, this is very straightforward. This can be done automatically through the proper choice of good generalized coordinates. Additional advantages of the Lagrangian formulation are, for example, that the Lagrangian is a Lorentz scalar. This means that is independent of the reference frame. We have the same Lagrangian in all reference frames, and so automatically the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion are relativistically invariant. We're going to come to this in the second part of the course. So this means that the Lagrangian formulation very naturally generalizes to special relativity. The Lagrangian formulation is completely generalizable. For example, there's a natural Lagrangian formulation of electromagnetism and all other physical laws. So the Lagrangian formulation goes beyond simple mechanics problems. And finally, the Lagrangian formulation reveals a deep connection between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And maybe this is the most important thing of all, because it really allows us to go to the quantum world and carry through many of the important concepts.
So let's pause for a moment here to discuss what this Lagrangian formulation means, both physically and philosophically. So the laws of Newton can be stated not only as f equals ma, but in another way, that the average kinetic energy minus the average potential energy is as small as possible for the correct path of an object going from one point to another. The total energy, which is the kinetic plus the potential energy, is of course a constant because the energy is conserved, but the energy can be transformed between kinetic and potential energy, and nature chooses to minimize this transfer. Why? Well, it's just an empirical fact, just as F equals ma itself was an empirical fact. The action formulation is actually quite different in character from Newton's original formulation. The action is expressed in terms of an integral equation, whereas Newton's second law is a differential equation. Newton's formulation is local, whereas the action formulation is global. What do I mean by this? Well, consider here uh, we have two different paths, one in red, one in blue. The question is, of course, as usual, which path is correct? According to the Newtonian approach, you can immediately distinguish between these two. You can see, do they satisfy Newton's second law? If the red one satisfies Newton's second law, then that's the right one. From the action perspective, however, we cannot tell yet between these two curves because we have to integrate the action over the entire path. So we would conclude that we can't yet distinguish which of these two paths is correct according to the action formulation because we need to wait until the entire path has concluded from start to end point before we can calculate the action and determine which one is lower. So the Newtonian approach is uh, local in the sense that at every point we can test to see which is the correct path, whereas the action formulation is global in the sense that we have to wait till the entire path is concluded. In particular, with the Newtonian formulation, I can take Newton's uh, differential equation of motion, Newton's second law, and in principle I can always convert it into a difference equation. What I mean by that is you could let the infinitesimal time step, dt, go to some finite but small time step, delta t, and then simply deterministically obtain the correct path at the next step and then iterate that solution, stepping forwards in time by delta t each time until the entire path is concluded. Of course, there are small errors introduced by, uh, by replacing dt by delta t, but as long as delta t is sufficiently small, we can expect that we'll have a fairly accurate approximation to our path. And indeed, as we send delta t back down to an infinitesimal dt, we'll recover the correct path. So obviously, therefore, Newton's equations are deterministic. If we have a knowledge of the system at the moment, the positions, velocities and forces, Newton's second law tells you unambiguously what will happen next. The action formalism as encapsulated by the principle of least section, is different. It is a global approach, not local, in time. We need to compute the action for the entire path over all time to know if it's the correct path. So within the action formalism, at this point, the beginning, we can't really tell which of these two paths is the correct one. So how does the particle know which is the minimum path? Of course, we just previously proved the equivalence, the exact equivalence of the two methods, Newton and the action principle. So worrying about such things is perhaps somewhat pointless. We know that the two approaches give exactly the same result. But still, it might seem somewhat unsatisfying. And in fact, philosophers has found this question somewhat fertile ground for debate, especially in relation to the implied teleology. So the point of contention here is as to whether or not the final state determines the whole path. In Aristotelian philosophy, teleology is the idea that everything has an ultimate purpose. Your path through the world is inevitably leading to and is determined by the set endpoint. So the raison d'etre of an acorn, for example, is to become an oak tree. But this is not really the case for classical mechanics. The path is not just determined by the endpoint, but by the variational principle itself. This is the principle of least action. The action of the correct path is a minimum and so what I want to explain to you is that why a minimum action variational principle like this always implies a deterministic differential law. So consider this trajectory of a particle in space and time. It starts off at t1 and ends at t2. 
it starts off at a given position, x1, and ends at x2. This is the true path, the actual path taken by the particle, and we know, therefore, that the action s here is a minimum for that entire path from t1 to t2. Let's suppose that along this correct path, the particle passes through a point A and another nearby point B. These points A and B are, are along the correct classical path. Now, the fact that the action integral from t1 to t2 is a minimum implies that the integral from A to B must also be a minimum. If it wasn't a minimum from A to B, then we could just play around with that small segment from A to B and to find a lower action for that part of the line, and then this would lower the overall integral for the action from t1 to t2. So the fact that we have an overall minimum action from t1 to t2 implies that every tiny line segment between t1 and t2 must itself have a minimum action. Every subsection of the path, however small, must be a minimum. And so the principle that the whole path has a minimum s therefore it implies that each infinitesimal segment has a minimum s as well. Now, over this small segment that we're considering from a to b, the way the potential varies doesn't really matter. If we were to consider an infinitesimal part of the path, sending a very, very close to b, then only the first order variation in the potential around that point can affect the energy, and hence the action. So the action can only depend on the first derivative of the potential at that point, or at least along the very short segment of the, the path considered. So the global statement about the whole path reduces to a local statement about each point, and it's a differential statement only involving the derivatives of the potential, i.e. the force. So we've again established the correspondence between the local and global approaches. So returning to this original figure here, we know that the particle can figure out which of the two paths is the correct path, by applying essentially the variational principle to a tiny part of the line segment in each case. There's another way in which we can ask this question. What if the particle really did sniff out all the other paths to determine which is the correct path, essentially applying the variational principle to work out which is the correct path at each point? What if all possible paths were explored by a particle before picking the correct one? This sounds totally crazy, but actually it's true. This is what happens in quantum mechanics. This is the path integral formulation, and we'll come on to that into the next lecture. We'll see how, from quantum mechanics, we see the principle of least action actually emerge in the classical limit. And this is the fundamental connection between classical and quantum mechanics that I mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. In the remainder of this lecture, I want to talk about a slightly different approach. This is the so-called Hamiltonian formulation, and it involves the total energy of the system. Let's first remind ourselves that the Lagrangian L is a function of the generalized coordinates Q, the generalized velocities Q dot, and also in principle time. So these are the independent variables of the Lagrangian. So this can be expressed mathematically by writing the total derivative DL of the Lagrangian. And the fact that we have independent variables, which are the positions and velocities, mean that we can say that a small increment in the Lagrangian, dl, can be expressed in terms of a small increment in the generalized coordinate, dq, and a small increment in the generalized velocity, dq dot, and a small increment in the time, which is also an independent variable, dt. And the amplitude along those different orthogonal directions, those independent directions, is precisely these partial derivatives dl by dq, keeping everything else constant, and the amplitude along the uh, velocity dq dot is simply partial dl by dq dot, and likewise the amplitude along the time t direction is dl by dt. So this is the mathematical way of expressing the to total differential dl. In this expression, we can actually already identify <clears throat> some interesting uh, things. So for example, this first term here, dl by dq, we can express that in terms of the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion as p dot, 
it's the generalized, it's the time derivative of the generalized momentum. Whereas this term, dl by dq dot, is by definition the generalized momentum p. <clears throat> and so we can write our total differential for the Lagrangian dl as p dot dq plus p dq dot plus dl by dt, lots of dt. So what we're going to do now is actually change variables. We're going to change the independent variables from position and velocity to position and momentum. How do we do that? Well, there's a general technique called the Legendre transformation, and it works like this in the present situation. Consider uh, a small increment d p q dot. This will be equal to p lots of a small increment of d q dot plus q dot lots of a small increment of p. Of course, that's just a statement of product rule. So let's now define a quantity, which I'll call h, as p q dot minus l. And let's consider now the small increment dh. What does that equal? Well, that's obviously going to be d lots of p q dot, which we've just calculated, minus dl, which we consider on the line above. So putting all of that together, we have p dq dot plus q dot dp, and then minus dl, which is p dot dq plus p dq dot plus dl by dt, lots of dt. And of course, the reason for constructing it in this way is now pretty clear, is because I can affect a cancellation of the velocity terms. So you notice that this term here, p dq dot, cancels with this term, p dq dot. And that eliminates the independent variable of velocity. Now this might seem a little bit confusing because you will notice there is still a q dot in this expression, but that's not an independent variable. The independent variables are the, are the differentials. So we have dp, dq in here. So our independent variables in this expression are the momentum and the position, as well as time. So here we have the final expression. And I just want to emphasize that here, the independent variables are the position, the generalized momentum, and time. So we have basically affected a change of variables from position, velocity, and time to position, momentum, and time. So this transformation from the uh, quantity L to the quantity H, where L depends on the positions, velocities, and time, and H depends on the position, momentum, and time, is called a Legendre transformation. And this is a standard trick in thermodynamics that you might have seen. This quantity H is called the Hamiltonian. whereas L is, of course, the Lagrangian. Now, in the simple case of one particle in Cartesian coordinates, the velocity is just x dot, let's say, whereas the momentum is px, which is just m times x dot. So the relation between the velocity and the momentum is trivial. However, in more complicated systems, when you go to generalize coordinates, the relation between the velocity and the momentum can be much more complicated. So this is a genuine difference when we go from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. In particular, position and momentum are so-called canonical variables. They are conjugate variables. And this might uh, ring a bell from the perspective of quantum mechanics, where position and momentum are conjugate. So here we've introduced the concept of the Hamiltonian H, for one particle um, in one dimension, 
on the previous slide, we de derived the expression that h is actually equal to p q dot minus l in terms of a given Lagrangian. But in general, it's easy to see that the Hamiltonian h is defined as being the sum over all generalized coordinates pi qi dot minus the total Lagrangian. So actually, this is the general definition of the Hamiltonian in terms of the Lagrangian for an arbitrary number of generalized coordinates. OK, so let's take this a bit further. Here, I have indicated that the Hamiltonian depends on the positions momenta and time. That means that we can play the same game of writing the total differential dh, and that should be equal to partial dh by dq, lots of dq, plus partial dh by dp, lots of dp, plus partial dh by dt, lots of dt. That's because the Hamiltonian depends on independent variables, position, momentum, and time, and therefore a small increment in h corresponds to a small increment upon along those independent directions q, p, and t. But on the previous slide, I actually derived an expression for dh directly, and it was q dot dp minus p dot dq minus dl by dt, lots of dt. And so actually, we can pair up and compare these two expressions. In particular, we can see that this term must match up with this term. They're both the dp terms, whereas this term must be equal to this term. They're both the dq terms. And then we have the two time terms here involving dt. So this actually, by comparing these two equations, we can actually identify three separate equations for the coefficients which we can match up of dq, the coefficients of dp, and the coefficients of dt. These are known as Hamilton's equations of motion, and they're as follows. So these are the three equations of motion according to Hamilton, and they involve partial derivatives of the Hamiltonian, so defined, in terms of uh, the variables p, q, and t. So the Hamiltonian here controls the dynamics of the system in the sense that if we know the Hamiltonian, we can take partial derivatives of it with respect to the position and the momentum, and that will tell us how the position and momentum change with time. That's the p dot and the q dot. We also see that the time dependence of the Hamiltonian is just identically equal to the time dependence of the Lagrangian up to a minus sign. So this is a rather interesting difference because the Lagrangian formulation gives an equation of motion which is one uh, second order differential equation, whereas Hamilton gives us two first order differential equations. So this is a slightly different way of doing things. And as it turns out, in many cases, the Hamiltonian formulation can be simpler, and we'll actually talk about that later on in the course. So we should now ask, what is the physical significance of the Hamiltonian itself? So first, let's consider explicitly one variable in one dimension, and show that the Hamiltonian is equivalent to the energy function. So from the previous definition, for one variable in one dimension, we have that the Hamiltonian h is p q dot minus Lagrangian l. Let's use Cartesian coordinates for one variable in one dimension. p is the momentum, which is m x dot. Uh, q dot is the generalized velocity, which here is another factor of x dot. Meanwhile, the Lagrangian is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, namely a half m x dot squared minus the potential v, which is a function of x.
So we see that actually there's some cancellations here. And overall, this gives us a half m x dot squared plus the potential v of x. And so the Hamiltonian is actually t plus v, the kinetic energy plus the potential, which is the total energy. So how does all of this generalize to arbitrary generalized coordinates in arbitrary dimensions? Well, it turns out that the Hamiltonian is always the total energy of the system, except in some special cases, which I just want to quickly sketch now. And we'll prove these and this general relation in a future lecture. So there's a few caveats to this generalization that the Hamiltonian is always the total energy. One is that the kinetic energy must be quadratic in the generalized velocities. What I mean by this is a term like t is proportional to qi dot qj dot for different generalized velocities qi dot and qj dot. If the kinetic energy cannot be cast in this form, then the Hamiltonian will not be in general the total energy. A second caveat to this rule is that we're not considering relativistic systems. We'll see that the Hamiltonian is not necessarily the energy in relativistic systems. The energy is actually something that depends on the reference frame. And thirdly, <clears throat> a scalar potential must exist for the system. So what this means is that the force is velocity independent. If we can't define a scalar potential for the system, we can't use the Lagrangian formulation, and therefore we can't define a Hamiltonian. However, in most systems we'll encounter, the kinetic energy will be quadratic in the generalized velocities. We're not initially going to be considering relativistic systems, and we're going to consider fundamental forces that can be cast in terms of a scalar potential. And in those cases, indeed, the Hamiltonian is equal to the total energy. As the last topic I want to cover in this lecture, I want to show that the energy is conserved. And I want to do this by using this Hamiltonian formulation. So a mathematical statement that the energy is conserved would be that dE by dt is equal to zero. That, of course, means that when we integrate it up, that the, e, the energy E is a constant and doesn't change with time. It's invariant, therefore it's conserved. In terms of the Hamiltonian, this therefore means that dH by dt must be equal to zero if the energy is conserved. And if, of course, the Hamiltonian uh, gives the total energy. So if energy is conserved, dH by dt is equal to zero. How do we prove this? Let's return to the equation that we derived earlier for the total differential dH. Let me just write it out again. We derived this a few moments ago. Let me write down the equation for dh in terms of small increments along the independent variables on which h depends, namely dp, dq, and dt. So if I want to find d an expression for dh by dt, I can simply take this expression for dh and essentially divide it by dt. Of course, there's a mathematically rigorous way of doing this, but uh, it's basically equivalent to doing the following. Let's just divide each of these differentials by dt. This last term here, dt by dt, that obviously just cancels. And what are these other items? Well, here we have dq by dt. That's the definition of the generalized velocity q dot. And here we have dp by dt, which is the definition 
of the, uh, p dot, the time dependence of the generalized momentum. And therefore, overall, I can write that dh by dt is equal to q dot p dot minus p dot q dot plus dh by dt. And of course, here we see some magic has happened. Uh, these first two terms cancel exactly. The final result then, and the important result, is that the total derivative dh by dt is equal to the partial derivative partial dh by dt. Um, this might seem like a funny kind of expression, it might seem obvious, but actually this is very deep and very profound. There's a big difference between total derivatives and partial derivatives. So in this expression, what we're saying is if there's no explicit time dependence of the Hamiltonian, partial dh by dt, if dh, partial dh by dt is equal to zero, then there's no implicit time dependence of the, of the Hamiltonian either. So what it's saying is if the Hamiltonian, as an equation, literally doesn't contain the parameter t for time, then it means that it, the Hamiltonian does not depend on time explicitly, and therefore it means that the total derivative dh by dt is equal to zero and energy is conserved. And since partial dh by dt is equal to minus partial dl by dt from Hamilton's equations, we know that if the Lagrangian itself doesn't contain an explicit time dependence, then energy is conserved. So we'll look at this in more detail in the coming lectures, and we'll give some examples to make this more concrete. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to cover in this lecture. We used the principle of least action to derive rigorously the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation of motion in arbitrary generalized coordinates, and then also looked at the Hamiltonian formulation that follows from that. In the next lecture, I want to briefly introduce you to the generalizations and extensions of this formulation. First of all, we're gonna look at the extension to special relativity. We're gonna consider the extension to electromagnetism, and finally, in the next lecture, we're going to look at the extension to quantum mechanics. And then we're going to get back to the main focus in the following lectures and study in more detail classical mechanics using this new framework.